As I draw closer, the music I had heard outside the city gates is getting louder, as is the laughter. The air fills with profanities, and when I round the corner, I blush at the scene that greets my eyes. Men and women of all ages are unleashing the passionate desires right in front of my eyes. Maybe coming through the market square was not such a wise idea after all. Several men stare and shout perverse words my way, but I've started running. Maybe not because I'm scared as much, but because I'm tempted to stay. Finally, breathless and a little shaken, I reach home, open the door and hurry upstairs to my bedchamber. The pleasures of this town are attractive to me. How did I not realize this before? It's Steph here. Hi, and it's Esther. Welcome to another episode of our Gigi podcast. We hope that you have been loving every single one and you're sharing it with your friends because we want to share the love. We do, and we love getting your feedback. We do get some girls writing, letting us know. And so thank you so much. We love, love getting that feedback and just your thoughts on what you think. Yes. And also something special today. We are in the kitchen again. Yes. And we are making some delicious hot soup for ourselves to keep us warm. Yeah. Especially if you have it with crusty bread Mm. and a bit of butter. And in your pajamas. (laughs) (laughs) yes we're going to share the recipe with you soon but first what did you think of that intro look it was really interesting um i know what story it is (laughs) so i know the ending but um yeah look it's it's scary when you know you shouldn't like something or do something, but you like doing it and it just mm, draws you. Draws you in. Yeah. So today we're sharing the story of Lot's wife um, and of their city, Sodom. Now you can find that story in Genesis 19, 1 to 29, but I would suggest to go back one more one more uh, chapter, maybe Genesis 18, because this is where Abraham is talking with God, the oh, angels. So you get like the back, oh, you the get backstory. A, yeah, yeah, you get a little bit, bit of the backstory of why God was going to destroy Sodom and how Abraham pleaded so he wouldn't burn the city. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so but Genesis 19, you can start from 18 and read it because a really good story. Yes, and it is a great story. We're going to get into it. But before we do, we're going to share this delicious barley and lemon soup. Barley and lemon soup serves six. Preparation time, 10 minutes. Cooking time, 45 minutes. You need six cups of water, 10 grams of vegetable stock cubed and crumbled, half a cup of pearl barley, one onion quartered, one clove garlic peeled, one bay leaf, three sprigs of fresh thyme, 400 grams of cannellini beans drained and rinsed, a quarter cup of lemon juice, a quarter cup of chopped fresh parsley, and one teaspoon of olive oil. And now for the method, how do you put it together? Number one, Bring the water, the stock cube and barley to the boil in a large saucepan over a medium heat. Number two, add onion, garlic, bay leaf and thyme. Simmer for 45 minutes or until the barley is tender. Number three, remove the pan from the heat and allow to cool slightly. Remove the bay leaf and thyme and discard. Number four, Place the mixture into the bowl of a food processor, add the cannellini beans and process until smooth. Number five, stir through the lemon juice. Serve sprinkled with parsley and a drizzle of olive oil. Ooh, that sounds delicious. I can't wait to try it. And you can actually find the recipe girls on our blog and the link will be below. Um, We just really want to say thank you to Sanitarium for sharing this recipe with us. Mm -hmm. Again, they have some amazing things, so make sure you check them out as Mm -hmm. well. And all vegetarian, like we're vegetarian, so we usually look for recipes that are vegetarian and we want to share them with you. Um, Okay, so we're going to get into the episode, which it's really about a Christian that is spiritually hot. So if we are cold, we do something about it. So, you know, when you're cold, you wear oh, you rug warm up. clothes, you drink hot drinks like hot chocolate, you have soup. So you do something to warm your body. But I feel that when it comes to our spiritual life, we don't really worry about how we feel 
or how cold we are spiritually because we don't even notice at that time. I say that. We don't realize that we're spiritually no, cold. Because we don't feel that shivering or like my joy is, you know, because I'm cold. Yeah. And I think like Lot's wife um, in the story, she probably was a woman who was spiritual at a point mm. or at a time, I think. Yeah. The Bible doesn't say much about her. No, but I mean, she married a really righteous man. According to the Bible, you know, Lot was a really good, godly man who wanted to help. You know, she would have been a godly woman, mm. I think. Yeah. And I think that um, her surroundings and the influence around her changed her slowly. The story right at the end, she says, how did I not realize that I was attracted to this? And I think like we said, you know, where you are will change you. And there's actually a verse in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 33, and it says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Mm, it does because you, you start getting influenced by, by that. But um, I think we should get into the story Ooh, so yes. that the girls can listen to a little bit more about Mrs. Lot. Lot. <laughs> and I guess some of her thoughts of what could have happened. So again, yes. it's in first person. Um, but yeah, read All the right. Bible account later. Enjoy. Don't look back. The soft afternoon wind caresses me as I sit amongst the luxurious vegetation of the Jordan Valley. Giant palm trees shade my face and the fragrance of flowers blooming in the nearby fields wafts through the air. I smile in delight and sigh. Oh, how I adore Sodom. I can't imagine any place better than this. I smirk, thinking of my husband Lot's absurd suggestion a few years ago. It lingers in my mind as if it was only yesterday. He'd had the audacity to suggest that we needed to move to a less corrupt town. He said he didn't want our children growing up here. How ridiculous, considering he was the one who had picked this location when his uncle Abraham gave him a choice of which land he wanted. But he's been obsessed about the corruption that has invaded the city. Honestly though, a little bit of dancing and pleasure never hurt anyone. At the time, I'd panicked. Where else did he think we would find happiness? Sodom is like no other place. Lavish with riches and jewels, and abundant in palm trees, olive vines, flowers, flocks and herds in the surrounding hills and not to mention the perfect trading location for my favorite delicacies and trinkets from the traders crossing the desert and coming through our markets with the best the world has to offer. Everything is effortless here in Sodom, and the year-long festivities just reel my senses. This is the place I do want my children growing up in. Finally, after weeks of argument, I won the battle, and we settled comfortably into our daily routine. Thanks to my persistence, I am now enjoying the beauty of my surroundings. I hear the sound of drums and boisterous laughter echo across the plains. I can already imagine what they're up to. Abraham has forbidden us to participate in any of their drunken festivities. They always lead to unrestrained and brutal passion, he said. Although I enjoy the music, there is one thing I do not approve of, their sexual deprivation. I always remind Abraham that we have nothing to do with that part. My heart wants nothing to do with that part either. All I want is to live in a beautiful place surrounded by comfort and riches and secretly enjoy the delicious music that makes my heart dance. The sun is fading and I reluctantly know that I must make my way home. Lot will be sitting at the city gate waiting for any poor soul who needs hospitality for the night. I cringe and crinkle my nose in distaste. He's like a pet stall owner who picks up every stray human walking through the city gates. It irks me that we have to host at least one pauper in our house each night. We have come to an agreement though. If he wants to host these people in our house, then he must tend to them. Besides, the next few months will be very busy for me as we prepare for our daughter's weddings. Oh, the very idea of my girl's weddings absolutely thrills me. Rich food, music, new clothes and jewelry. I feel giddy at the thought. The night air is beginning to cool and I head home. Lot does not approve of me being alone at this late hour. I look at the sky and an involuntary shiver runs down my spine. There's a tinge of redness scratched across it, as if the claw of an animal has reached up and tried to tear it up. Intrigued and a little uneasy, I increase my pace. As I enter through the city gates, I notice that Lot is not sitting at his usual place. I'm sure he's already found some stray to take home and feed. Ugh, revolting. I mutter under my breath and decide to take the long way home via the markets. There's always someone conjuring up entertainment in the market square. It's the heart and fun and frivolity in this city, or as Abraham would say, the heart of corruption. I untie the soft purple material from around my waist and wrap it around my head. There's no need to be recognised. As I draw closer, the music I had heard outside the city gates is getting louder, as is the laughter. 
The air fills with profanities, and when I round the corner, I blush at the scene that greets my eyes. I try to look away, but I find it's not easy. A very handsome man walks towards me, his smile sensual, eyes burning with fire. He grabs my hand and whispers in my ear. My heart starts thumping in my ribs and I shake my head no. Lot has never said such things to me. A tinge of excitement and panic seizes me, and I begin to hurry. Men and women of all ages are unleashing the passionate desires right in front of my eyes. Music, laughter and depravity are mixing to one loud cacophony of sound, and I'm desperately hurrying home. Maybe coming through the market square was not such a wise idea after all. Several men stare and shout perverse words my way. I've started running. Maybe not because I'm scared, as much as because I'm tempted to stay. Finally, breathless and a little shaken, I reach home, open the door and hurry upstairs to my bedchamber. I throw myself on my bed, take off my headscarf and exhale. My mind is swirling. I don't understand how I'm feeling. Maybe I am a woman of Sodom after all. The pleasures of this town are attractive to me. How did I not realize this before? Suddenly I hear shouts and banging in our front door. I jump up and race to the balcony to see what's happening. Men from every part of the city, young and old, have surrounded my home. Have they come for me? No, impossible. I was in disguise. Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so we can have our pleasure with them. I gasp. Lot had brought men into our home? How many? I hear the front door open and see the top of Lot's head, his hands extended pleading. No, my friends, do not do this wicked thing. Do not do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. But the mob cannot be stopped. Get out of our way, Lot! They shout furiously. The pushing and shoving become more violent, and I'm scared now. What if they kill Lot? Who would look after me? I need them to stop. They might listen to me. I head out of my room and crash straight into my daughter's. Mother, you're home. We're so scared. The men from the brought home have done something and the crowd outside can no longer see. They're blind. I frown. Where is your father? I'm heading down to put a stop to this. No, mother. Stay here. Those two strange men just said that we have to get out of here. They, they said they're going to destroy Sodom. My youngest interrupts, her voice quivering. The noise outside has finally stopped and I breathe easier. The door slams again and I hear voices. Hurry. Take your wife and your two daughters, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. But, but this, th- this is our home. Lot hesitates. Lot, hurry and get your daughters and wife. The voice is speaking very firm. Silence. Then in a flash, the men are upstairs grabbing my hand and my girl's hands. You don't have much time, let's go. Go where? I drag my feet as they pull me down the stairs. You can't do this to us. This is our home. I shout. The men are not listening to me. It's as if I'm invisible. At the bottom of the stairs, Lot is waiting and wringing his hands. Lot, what is happening? I demand an explanation. Darling, the city is going to be destroyed. We will all die if we don't get out of here. We must listen to these men. I shake my head, trying to clear the cobwebs clouding my thinking. I don't understand. Just a few hours ago, I had been outside enjoying my thoughts of Sodom. And now it's going to be destroyed? Impossible! The girls are sobbing quietly in the background and I pull away from the strange man's hand. I can't leave. I haven't even packed. My voice squeaks in despair. Then I remember the red claw-like tinge in the sky earlier this evening. Could that have been a sign? The look on the men's faces is somber. Maybe they're right. Okay, okay. I hear the words coming out of my mouth and cannot believe I'm saying them. Let me pack a few of my jewels and my most expensive things. We can take as much as we can tonight and then come back. No! The men grab our arms and start pulling us. We need to go now. I start to tremble. And leave my things? No, no, no! The men are pulling us, but I dig in my heels. Lot is muttering under his breath and the girls are sobbing. None of us wants to leave. My heart belongs here in Sodom. I belong in Sodom. Sodom is everything to me. The harder I dig in my heels, the lighter I become. The strength of these men is too much for me, and it feels like we are flying down the narrow streets of our beloved home. They drag us out of the city as if we are as light as feathers on a bird. They're not even sweating. We come to an abrupt halt, and they speak again. Flee for your lives. Don't look back, and don't stop anywhere on the plain. Flee to the mountains, or you will be swept away. Mountains? We panic and Lot pleads. No, my lords, please. If your servant has found favour in your eyes and you have shown great kindness to me in sparing my life, I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me and I'll die. 
Look, there is a small town of Zora and it's near enough to run to. Let me flee to it. It is very small. My life will be spared there, won't it? The men look at each other and finally one speaks. Very well, I will grant this request too. I will not overthrow the town you speak of, but flee there quickly, because I cannot do anything until you reach it. We start running. I feel sick. My heart bleeds. To lose everything? No, this can't be real. Maybe I'm having a nightmare. I look down at my swollen, filthy feet and realize this is my reality. The sun is rising over the horizon as we reach Zora, and an explosion reverberates under our feet. I gasp, sob, my house, my precious home and city, destroyed. I have to look back. I must see what is left. It's such a good story and it's sad to see how, you know, during the story she started getting away from God. And girls, if you don't know what happened to her at the end of that story, you need to go and search in your Bibles and read Genesis. What happened when she turned around? Mm -hmm. Don't look back. That was what the instruction and she did. Yes, and she did. Um, And I think there are some ways that we can see if we are getting spiritually cold. Mm. If we're ever in the snow, the first thing we do is we don't wear a T-shirt and and a shirt or a little dress or a little skirt. You put clothing that warms you up. Thermals, beanie, gloves. Yeah, exactly. Because if you don't cover all your body, this is where you can start getting um, sick. Yeah, you can start getting sick. But you also can lose limbs because, you know, you lose the feelings. That's right, you get Yeah, Yeah. hypothermia. So um, when... Like if you ever leave church or when people leave church or if your heart is not in church, the effects are the same. Yeah, you can just be an empty shell sitting there. Yes. And our spiritual clothing is what helps us survive out in the cold, you could say. And when we take that protection away, things change. You know, at first you might not feel um, detached from your source of warmth. You might just want to get away from church for a while because you've been wronged or you blame God for something or you just don't feel it anymore. But that's the first step. Getting away from God, whether you intend it or not, has its consequences. And I've seen it so many times. And they're very slow consequences. You know, the enemy is very, very patient, actually. And he will wait, oh, even yes. if it's years, until you're like like Mrs. Lot. You know, like, that's right. well, how did I get here? What happened? Yes. She didn't realize she loved it. And then your heart will eventually crave that warmth again, that spiritual warmth, because that warmth comes from the Holy Spirit. And, um, and then this is where we have choices. That's it. We do have choices. And the thing is that your spiritual life cannot depend um, on anyone. You know, you can't depend on your parents, mm. your friends, your aunts, your brothers and sisters. In this case, it was her husband. Um, it's up to you to seek that relationship yes. with God. Mm. No one can do it for you. You can pray for people, but you can't do things mm. for them. And you can get encouragement from people. To build, you know, a relationship with God, but nobody can can do that for you. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got a little uh, illustration, you could say. It's called Ice Queen in from the cold. Ice Queen in from the cold. How did it get so cold? I'm not prepared. I hadn't even noticed until now. How far have I walked? Hours? Days? Months? I'm so lost and so, so cold. I'm surrounded by white points glistening ice. Emptiness hits me with a sharpness that hurts. But I see a faint flicker of warm candlelight far away in the distance. What's happened? Don't my family care that I'm missing? Haven't they sent someone for me? I dig my hands deep into my pockets searching for any amount of warmth. Numb. I can just make out a small piece of torn paper. A tiny spark of warmth. Reading the words, I look around and see another piece of paper flutter against the white snow. A trail of fragments that I can follow, if I just collect each piece. Looking up, I see where the trail has led me. My church. I can see that there's warmth and light in there. It's almost emanating through the walls. I want to get inside, but there's no handle on the door. Watching and waiting for what seems like hours, I turn. Maybe I should just go back out into the ice. Maybe I can survive a little longer. Maybe I can get used to the cold. 
That is such a great story. It's a great illustration of us. When we get away from God, when we go away from him, we think that there is no hope. But what do we do? Do we find God or do we walk away? Hmm, That's the tricky question. And I think it's the same way when we are unwell. Oh, yes. You need to go and see a doctor. So if you are sick, you go, take a few days off work, um, and you need to recover to get better. And mm. I think the same is for church. You know, church is a Christian's hospital. We're all sick. We, we can't say that we're in church because mm. we're perfect. We're sick not. Sick of sin, like you know, sinners. Yeah, yeah, we are sinners. And that's why we go to church to get healing from God, who is our doctor, mm. our spiritual doctor, and he heals us. And I believe that going to church is essential for a healthy Christian life. This is where you get other Christians who you know, who help you spiritually and you connect with them. Even though now things are done via Zoom at the moment because we can't meet in church. But if you can get to a Zoom meeting uh, with your youth, it's important to keep that connection. Yeah, don't let it fall. I think it's really easy to just get complacent and like, well, you know, there's difficult times happening at the moment. We can't get together. And slowly you start getting colder. Mm, It is. And how do we really know that we are drifting? I mean, since it happens so subtly... So subtly, is that even a word? So subtle. (laughs) So subtle. (laughs) Um, I want to check some symptoms, you could say, that will check if we are feeling cold, spiritually cold. Ooh, let's see what they are. All right. Okay, so symptom number one. This is if you're feeling this. I'd rather spend the time on Instagram or TikTok, texting or playing games in church. I count down to when it's all over. The diagnosis. Church should be a day of happiness where you feel refreshed and rejuvenated. Don't rely on just one day a week to have a relationship with God. So what can you do? The treatment for this is to have a closer personal walk with Him. Spend every day starting by reading a few verses or a chapter in the morning. Um, Psalms or the Gospels are great to start off with, but you need to start that personal relationship with God. It says in Isaiah 55, 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Symptom number two. I don't pray anymore. And if I do, it's the same word, same prayer. I don't even remember what I said. It's meaningless. Diagnosis. You are neglecting your prayer life and that is like neglecting breathing. It gives your life meaning to pray and it's a Christian secret weapon. The treatment for this? Start your day by thanking God and change it up though. You don't always have to say the same things or make it overly complicated. For example, dear Jesus, thank you for another day. Please help me get to school safely. Amen. Or dear Jesus, thank you for the clothes I have and please help my grandma who has been sick. Amen. God is like a friend. Talk to him like you would your friend. He loves that. Think of the circumstances in your life that you can be talking to him about. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 to 18, it says, Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, just for an extra boost, here are some added vitamins. Pray at night as well, just before you go to bed. So morning and night will just boost you up. Symptom number three. I hate so-and-so from my church. He's so hypocritical. He loves to point out all the things people do wrong. I'd rather live than be part of this hypocrisy. The diagnosis. Even though we are told to reflect God, sadly, many people don't. And we find hypocrites inside the church just as we do outside. The treatment? Like us, they are sinners too. We really don't have the right to judge them either. They will be held accountable to God for their actions and words. Don't be dismayed. Pray for them because they're blind to their behavior. In Matthew 7, 1 to 3, it says, Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judged others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Symptom number four. I want to have fun. I want to be young and free. Then I'll come back to church. I just need to have my rebellious stage. God is forgiving, isn't he? The diagnosis. For a start, thinking that you have to rebel to have fun just isn't true. You can have fun and know God. And if you can't, 
Well, it's because the fun you might seek involves sin. Consider the consequences. Sin is a very dangerous game. The treatment? Pray about it and consider the people around you. Are they helping you or pulling you away from God? Surround yourself with those who will lead you closer to Jesus. Then find the fun things you can do without hurting yourself or others. In Romans 6, 22-23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Symptom number five. The programs are boring. The people are boring. And the music is boring. My church is boring. The diagnosis. Is church really the problem? Boredom occurs when we stay at the edges and don't get involved. The treatment. Get involved in an area in your church where you can make a difference. If you like computers, then get involved in audio-visual aspect. If you like music, then get involved in praise and worship team. Find your niche. If you think you're too young to make a difference, you're not. Age is not a barrier if you want to work for God. So we've just looked at a few of the cold symptoms, spiritual I would call, cold spiritual symptoms that you might experience when you're drifting away from God. So do any of those ones we said describe how you're feeling? We want to give you this time to have some personal writing time. You know, write down what you're feeling at the moment, what you think you can do during this not church going season since we're all, I guess, in lockdown. Write down what you would like God to change in you. You know, the beautiful thing about this is that God is also patient and he offers redemption, forgiveness, and he offers us love. In Jeremiah 33, 8, it says, I will cleanse them from all the sin they have committed against me, and I will forgive all their sins of rebellion against me. You'll find that only one thing truly warms us, and that is the precious blood of Jesus who came to die for us. You know, we all need a second chance. And he's given us that. We just have to come to him. He won't judge you and he definitely will not abandon you. He'll give you love and he'll warm your heart so you're not cold again. Mm. And, you know, if you want to get to know God a bit more, try this um, text, this Bible verses. I'm just going to read them and then your homework is to find them in your Bible and highlight them. Print them if you need to, whatever it is, so that you know. We've got Isaiah 118. We have John 15, 9. And Matthew 26, 28. So go hunting in your Bibles and see what these uh, verses say to us. But what actually happened to the girl in the icy wilderness? You know, what, what did she do? Did she turn back and freeze? I mean, there's no door handle. Does that mean God doesn't want her to come in? Hmm. Well, the resolution is totally up to you. But let me give you a hint. If you push on the door, you'll notice that it was never locked behind you when you left. So the girl should have pushed uh, before walking away. So, ooh, our soup is bubbling and it looks ready and it smells divine. It smells amazing. <laughs> so girls, as you notice, the soup took a little while to cook. Like it doesn't, you just don't put it on and it's cooked straight away. You need to wait a good 45 minutes to an hour. And our spiritual life is just like that. We need to persevere through the boredom. Through that feeling of, oh, I don't want to do this. You've got to persevere and don't give up. It will get less boring each time. Trust us. Because you will get to know the person more, which is Jesus. The more time you spend with him, especially in the mornings, it's crucial to start with him, the more on fire you'll feel for him. And definitely start with, um, what is it, the, the Gospels? Yes, the New Testament? Matthew, John, Luke, Mark. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yes. So um, make sure you do that. Talk to someone if you need to, but don't let yourself be out spiritually cold because you need God to be with you every single day. So girls, we will see you again next time. But before we do leave, we have a question. Okay, 
Okay, so this question was for Chaplain Peters. He uh, wrote for a magazine a few years ago, and we had a question that says, what top five qualities should I look for in a guy? Mm. Ooh, okay, let's have a look. What did he say? So he needs to be spiritually and emotionally mature. Yes. Yes, that's definitely, yes, that's true. You don't want to be carrying someone. You want someone that's going to help you along. Spiritually, Spiritually, yeah. Spiritually, yes. And emotionally, well, you want a man. You don't want a baby (laughs) that you have to, you know, change nappies and that. Do you know what I mean? Oh, that's hilarious. Okay, the second one says he needs to love and obey God. So important. If he obeys God, he's going to have those good morals and he's going to treat you well. He needs to honor and respect his parents. Oh, my goodness. This The way he treats his mother is the way he's going to treat you. Mm-hmm. Or worse. So if he treats her well and he's caring and, you know, a great son, well, you know, great. Yes. If he's not, well, that's you in like two years. Yeah. So definitely not. Um, He needs to be established in his career or working towards that because I know you girls are still at school. So he needs to be a guy who wants to succeed in life. And I know that not everybody's going to be like a lawyer or a doctor, but he's got to be hardworking mm-hmm. in whatever it is, like construction, mechanic, yep. but hardworking. That's right. Um, he needs to be able to prove to your family that he can protect and care for a family of his own. Mm, that is really important. So there you go. Those are the top five qualities. If you need to go back, rewind and write them down, do that. And pray to God to send you a man who is spiritually hot, you could say. <laughs> that's <laughs> what we're that. talking about. So, okay, that's it for us. Thank you, Chaplain Peters. Yes, thank you. All right, girls, that's it for now. Till next time. Bye, girls. Bye. You're listening to For King and Country. Control. me to let go, but I thought I knew better, afraid of surrender, and what I don't know, I've always had a plan, but now I'm so weary, and I can't see clearly, forgot who I am, so won't you make my eyes, your eyes, my ears, your ears, my tears, your tears, and won't you make my hands, your hands, my feet, your feet, my dreams.